Hello again, uh, everybody. I'm happy to give you now uh, an overview of our ECB financial integration and structural report uh, about what's happening in these fields in the, in the area. Uh, it's joint work with many ECB uh, colleagues from uh, many business areas. Uh, I think we had to curse across markets, and sorry, we had to cut across borders inside the institutions as well. Uh, so international uh, research statisticians, you have a statistical annex which has been pre-released, uh, which is backing most of the things I will present. But we have also people from market, market operation and uh, uh, financial stability, payment system, what have you. All right. So I will, uh, I would say, slightly contrary to the report itself, which has a, a very strong focus on policy steps, echoing very much what we've just heard. You will have uh, another uh, service of this with our vice president a bit later today. Here, I will focus really on the ethical part, which is like the, the second part of the report. And I will do that in, uh, in, in three uh, steps in a way, or three ways. I will uh, first uh, talk about the context in which this report has been produced. It's only every two years that we produce the report at the ECB. So things have changed somewhat over the last two years. Um, on the macro, economic, and financial side, relatively obviously, so setting the stage in a way. Then I will talk about the financial structure, the financial integration based on the indicators that uh, colleagues in statistics and research have developed. And then as we go along, I will mention some of the boxes because we have deep dives in the report on certain topics uh, where we uh, give more details and provide more analysis. I will remain relatively high level, not that technical, but that's a bit of a teaser for some of the deep dives that we have in the, in the report. So first, let me talk about the background uh, with respect to two years ago. Uh, remember, in 2022, we were just coming after two so-called like secular shocks, one after the other within two years, with the pandemics and, and, and war in Europe, which had had huge consequences on, on the macro and also the financial uh, aspects. Um, and, and this is really, maybe if you look at the right-hand side chart here, which shows in blue the inflation rate with two digit uh, being passed, uh, as you may recall, and then the yellow line, which is the ECB uh, policy uh, rate, the key policy rate, with at the end, uh, on the far right-hand side, the yellow line going up and up and up, the sequence of hikes, uh, which uh, has been the case until very recently. Why did we see this? Because we had huge shocks on commodity prices, in particular oil prices, that we see on the uh, left-hand side, uh, on, the, on the blue line, and then this is still something that we see now, pressure on commodity prices has not evaporated fully, and there may be further hikes uh, down the road. And then you have the yellow line there, which is the new risk in a way, or prevailing risk, like in our financial stability review, where we have a special uh, uh, part uh, on these aspects, to which extent geopolitical risks. Here, this is the Jacovello et al. indicator, which is basically uh, like showing war, a conflict uh, type of indicator. So we see at the very end of the, of the sample some sort of hikes in this geopolitical index. We are very far from the 9-11 or, or the Gulf Wars type of thing, but still, this is going up and this is seen as a, as a major risk for trade, for asset prices, and that's where financial integration does matter a lot in such a, a tense environment on the macro side because inflation and high interest rates uh, and because of geopolitical tensions, trade restrictions, what have you, we need a resilient system. And this is in this context that we have also the strategic autonomy type of thing, which uh, for the uh, EU is really important. This is very much related to policy objectives uh, that I will uh, finish the, the presentation with. Uh, focusing, of course, on capital market union. Oops. Yeah. Some uh, status fact on the structure. On the left hand side, you see the, the volumes for banks, non banks, and the ECB uh, asset size. Of course, they are the sort of exit from the uh, uh, 
policy steps taken right after the great financial crisis during the Euria debt crisis as an effect, namely the balance sheet of the ECB and the assets held, therefore, in the financial system are, are declining. Otherwise, we've got a decline as well for the blue, which is the banks, and the red, which is the uh, non-bank and BFI institutions, but this is mostly a valuation effect. So this is really because the, the pricing of the assets has declined somewhat. What we see on the right-hand side are the volume translated in shares. In green, we have the ratio of um, NBFI with respect to, to banks. And there, it's uh, interesting to see that after like uh, the increase of about like almost two decades, there's been a, some decline or rough stabilization over the last two years of the market share, if you like, of the NBFI vis-à-vis -vis the, the standard bank. So a bit of an interruption in the, in the trend there. Otherwise, uh, outside the uh, euro system uh, sort of stabilization and initiated decline, there's a rather stable picture in terms of the structure. If we focus on... Um, ABFIs, so zooming in onto these uh, subsectors, so to say. On the left hand side, we see that the recent moves up and down were driven by investment firms. Uh, and that's uh, also related to moves in the insurance. And uh, so that's the, the, the green, blue uh, parts in, in the bars that you see on the left hand side. So investment funds. Insurers, pension funds have really driven the, the changes in the NBFI's uh, sector recently. On the right hand side, there you see um, the, 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 the split in terms of the total amount, which is the red line of um, investment funds uh, assets. They remain mostly outside the area. There's been a stabilization, that's the, the, the yellow part, even a sort of slight increase over the recent two years of the Euria holdings, but it's still lots of activity outside the Euria for these funds. All right, turning now to our integration indicators, uh, which are basically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, indices based on dispersion and volatility across countries and across financial products. And we compute these kind of indicators both for prices, say stock prices, bond prices, or quantities like uh, holdings of deposits or holding of debt securities across uh, across countries. So the blue line is the price-based indicator. The yellow line is the quantity-based indicator. Um, and then uh, focusing first on the price-based indicator, you see that we have, despite the pandemic, despite the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the latest event on the right-hand side of the, of the chart, we see some resilience of the, of the indicator, which is like the, the positive part of it. Having said that, uh, I think the key messages are elsewhere. Namely, uh, recently, over the last two years or so, there's been a decline in these indicators. Both the blue and the yellow line are lower than they were, uh, say, in the, year, in the beginning of, of, the, of the 2020. And then, second key message there as well, well, if you look at the dotted line, blue and yellow, this is the starting point when monetary union started. And what we see there is that we're not doing better. So there has been no marked progress, but there's been resilience. But the fact that there's no marked progress is uh, sort of worrisome. So in this report, we also have, uh, as I said, some uh, deep dives. We have no less than eight boxes on key topics with respect to financial integration. And we have in particular paid specific attention to Ireland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, not just to name countries, but that's because these are the location of the main vehicles for investment by other countries. So as a, as a vehicle, as, a, as an agent there. What is the conclusion of the, or what are the main conclusion uh, of, the, of the analysis presented in the box? First, many investors uh, use those countries or the funds located in country to invest outside the euro area. But conversely, also investors from outside the euro area reinvest uh, in the euro area via these uh, channels. 
The caveat on this is that, as a matter of fact, many investors in a given country would go via funds located in Ireland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, to invest back in their own country. So in a way, that's biasing the, the indicators, and that's the uh, kind of things we can see on the chart there, which is showing home bias. So to translate, this is the share of domestic uh, share or equity or bonds that are held by people. And when you want to have diversification at the country level, uh, you would expect the own bias to be lower. Once you correct from the indirect holding of own securities via the uh, funds located in Ireland, Luxembourg, and Netherlands, what you see in particular for equity, this is the right and the left hand side, is that the equity own bias is higher on the uh, yellow line than it is on the blue line. So that the bro number are, are the blue line and, and the yellow line, then we go to something very similar to the US. This is true for equity going indirectly owning your equity own market equities via the funds located elsewhere in the area this is much less true uh, for pounds so as a result we see once we do this kind of adjustment that the area is less integrated with the rest of the world but also less integrated within the uh, the euro area a closer look at integration for bonds where we've seen the correction was uh, not so much impacted by the financial center uh, correction that we did, uh, we have a stabilization. And, and, and then uh, what we see in the uh, left-hand side, that's the, the, the quantity indicators, uh, just uh, following the, the blue line there, intra-area uh, bond holdings has been going up and down, but is, uh, is increasing over the, the medium term. Another thing quite important is the red line, which shows the ratio between long-term to short-term debt instruments. And then there's a, a sort of rebound towards long-term uh, lending uh, with respect to, to what we had uh, beforehand. The other chart is the blue on the right-hand side is the price indicator. We see lots of ups and downs. That's volatility on the bond market. But what's interesting there is that despite all of the turbulences we've seen in financial markets, including in some banking sectors, as you know, uh, I think we're, we're not in that bad a situation. But still, if you look at the indicator before the great financial crisis, which it, we're, we're still a bit lower. But I would say, uh, taking into account the fundamentals that could drive the, the prices for, for bonds, I think this is not probably uh, the main problem area. We also have um, okay. Sorry for the uh, some problem with the pointer here. Um, we also look at the integration uh, for bonds uh, in in sense of looking at the role of EU bonds. So this is the new generation EU. The the support for unemployment in emergencies or the green bonds in particular so we look at who holds them and what we see on the chart there we have the banks which is the biggest bar and it's there quite interesting for the other sectors insurers investment funds pension funds as we go from left to right uh, on, from a country perspective we see the big five countries for the banks but then we have some specialization for the insurers the french at the lion's share for investment fund, it's Luxembourg, and for pension fund, it's Netherlands. So it's reflecting the, the specialization, if you like. Um, what we could see there as room for improvement is that the both the volume of, of the funding uh, that is dedicated to green bonds could be increased. And also, uh, there could be, let's say, some improvement even from a purely technical perspective so that the risk premium for such bonds would come closer to those of large sovereign and it's not a rating issue actually it's more a liquidity free float um, that the type of issue um, that transaction cost not included in futures or what have you which uh, prevent uh, those bonds to be really as good on from market and pricing perspective as the large sovereign So we look also at uh, activities of banks cross border, my God, uh, by sectors. And, 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 and what we see there is that the lending 
due to interbank lending that has resumed across the, the borders of the, of the Union has increased. But at the same time, it's really more uh, sort of bank level on, on the retail uh, type of thing. It, it's a bit of a, of a different picture. Uh, if you look at the price index, which is again the, the blue line on, on the right, uh, we see a decline, and this is related to a very specific thing. It can be identified why we have this decline, albeit from a, a higher level. Uh, so it's not as good as the picture for bonds. It's really because of deposit pricing, where we know there are lots of country-specific, banking sector-specific approaches across uh, the euro area, and this is why we see this decline here. Equity market, last but not least, on the, on the product. Uh, we see uh, stable shares, this is the, the right-hand side, the left-hand side, uh, sorry, the bars. We see a uh, very stable share between domestic, across borders, and across border but coming from outside the euro area. So there's, the volume is, is changing, the size of the bar, but the, the, the various uh, configuration, the structure, if you like, is not very different. Let me say a few words on the uh, right-hand side chart, which is about the foreign direct investment uh, with respect to portfolio investment. Two things on this. Uh, there had been, uh, if you look at the uh, ratio there, which is the red line, foreign direct investment deemed superior because of long term, more productive than portfolio investment. We had in the most recent crisis a drop in this and there's been a, a recovery. However, over the recent period, there's still a sort of uh, not so strong share of, of FDI in, in uh, investment from the external side in the, in the area. This was about listed shares, by the way, what I presented uh, on equity. And we have also a box about listing or even delisting. Uh, the interesting conclusion there is that we don't see in the data a sort of I would say, unusual development in delisting or unlisting shares with respect to historical events. Because you have M&As, you have firms that disappear, and what we've seen recently, there's no like acceleration or, or, or deep change in that. At the same time, when we compare with the US, and this is about the, uh, the chart that are there on the, on the screen, uh, if you look at the uh, right-hand side in particular, we see market capitalization, um, of EU uh, countries, uh, US listed only, dual uh, firms uh, is the blue line. We see a sort of explosion in the capitalization and the share of so-called dual firms, that is to say firms that decide to be listed in the area, but also in the US. And why do they also go in the US, as long as they don't go only to the US? Well, they can get capital there, and that may help also on our side eventually. But the reasons we identified were depths of the market and very much related to points that were mentioned by the commissioners beforehand. It's simpler uh, type of thing because you have uh, one regime and, and, and not the same complexity. It's easier from a regulation perspective. And you have also a deeper market as opposed to a more shallow one, especially if you look at financial markets that are still financial centers fragmented and segmented within the euro area. All right, before finalizing the, the presentation with a quick uh, overview of the or linking to the policy steps, uh, let's say we have three areas of, of interest that we have identified. First, mobilizing the savings, also echoing what was said before, in particular household savings that can be used. There's lots of deposits. This is the far left-hand side chart. Lots of deposits, insurers, uh, pension funds. Household savings could be better used for more innovation and, and, uh, and productive uh, purposes. There's a second area, which is harmonization and regulation. So harmonizing, perhaps up to centralizing in some cases, and uh, also working on uh, simplifying or adjusting fine-tuning regulations. Third, facilitating, facilitating cross-border operations. Sorry for the terms. Um, and then I think two of the uh, cross-border can be, once again, within the area or from the outside, inside the area, as I said earlier. So these are the two other charts in the middle. 
what we see is that there is still a relatively low uh, role of um, banking uh, type of thing, which is not domestic. So the blue line is the pure domestic, and the other two are coming from other countries or coming from outside the area. So the shares there are, are very limited. So th there's a need to, to improve on that, obviously. If you look at the last chart, Euria Holdings, extra Euria uh, Holdings, in terms of how Euria securities are bought by, by outsiders, you see there as well, be it for equity, where we have a slightly larger share of extra Euria for investment funds and debt, it's, it's still relatively limited. So I will stop with uh, this chart at this point, showing six priorities that are listed in the report with a view to improving on the three uh, wheels that you see there, namely uh, facilitating uh, operation across borders. Then it has to do with crisis management and uh, cross-border banking in, in general. There's harmonization and regulation, so it's more at the even conceptual level. There may be definitions that differ for specific products or, or, or indicators across EU countries. And then a lot to be done on regulatory and supervisory architecture. Finally, on mobilizing saving, you have uh, standardization and transparency for structured product with a specific focus on securitization that we can uh, revive, as was uh, explained and elaborated upon before. And then a sort of generic overarching type of thing where it's a bit more difficult to identify concrete steps, to be, to be honest, but it has to do with financial literacy uh, as well and, and boosting venture capital so that the capital and equity market in the EU could be much more dynamic than it is now. Thank you.